So our task today is to give you a, a snippet, a high level, maybe 50,000 foot um, overview of what the practitioner experience will be in PeopleSoft. And um, first slide. <clears throat> Before we get started into that, we, we want to emphasize the, the one point on the Constitution, and that is the um, one source of data. And the PeopleSoft HCM model is just that. It's one source of data. And the illustration that we've got next on the next slide is kind of gives you a, a high-level overview of how everything is a part of one HCM system. You know, there, there, there are no, no silos. Once you hit the enter key, when you enter data, it's, the data is available across the system to all modules, to all users. So there's no time delay. <clears throat> that's a win, that's a win. <laughs> and the, the arrows, yeah, the arrows are gonna illustrate how the data interacts with the other modules, you know, which modules are impacted by data that comes from one source, and you'll see that HR has an impact on every part of the system because everybody needs the employees that, that HR generates. And then um, absence management feeds into HR. HR feeds into commitment accounting, being admin, time and labor. There's a relationship between time and labor and payroll where the data goes back and forth. All of your time transactions are gonna feed into payroll to, to be a part of your, your paycheck, et cetera. Um, and then in the end, once payroll is calced and finalized, a fee goes to commitment accounting and then there's an interface to the financial system that impacts the general ledger. And so the, the team is going to illustrate all of the aspects of this process flow from end to end from how the HCM 9.2 application is going to work. And this is going to be the user experience that the practitioners are going to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, <clears throat> some of the things that we're going to emphasize today is that um, we're going to take um, an employee, a faculty employee, and we're going to show you the faculty hire experience from the beginning, from adding his employee data. We're not actually going to add it. We're going to show that the system has captured that information in the interest of time. The job data experience, we're going to enroll this employee into some benefits. We're going to do some time transactions. We're going to do some absence management transactions on the employee. And then we're going to feed that information over into the payroll system, and we're going to show you the, the check that was calculated for that employee. And then after the calculation experience, payroll is going to feed down to commitment accounting, and we're going to show you how everything integrates with a financial application through the general ledger process. And we're going to talk about some of the, the new nuances in the 9-2 application that are going to be a lot different than the experience that you currently have in the ADP system. <clears throat> so um, some of the things that we want to, to um, point out also is that this afternoon, at 3.20, there is a panel discussion that will go more into detail about some of the um, business process decisions and designs that, that will be a part of the deployed solution that you're going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, please make a note to attend that session at 3.20. It's going to be in the, um, I think it's going to be in this room or next door. It's in one of the Oglethorpe rooms. So check your calendars to see where that is. So first up, we're going to have Lori Jones and Christine Lesher to, um, to walk us through the HR experience. Okay, so good morning everybody. Good morning. We get to see what the system looks like. But first I want to go to the next slide on the PowerPoint. And uh, this is the hire process. Not really anything new. We've got personal data, job data, employment data. Let's go to actually see what the system looks like using the personal data. <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Stallone. Remember, this is a demo. It'll go a whole lot faster once we're live. So you notice Sylvester Stallone. You've got your uh, biographical details, your date of birth, biographical history. Let's look at the contact information. And for those of you that were in Joe Britton's session, you'll see that you've got your addresses, phone information, email addresses, instant mes message IDs. I just want to reiterate what Joe said. You, we've got multiple phone and email possibilities, but the business, the business types for both email and phone are locked. 
So the institution gets to control those. So that's a yay. And then, of course, we've got the regional information. And as Joe said, the employee enters the information, but HR always approves it. So let's go back to the, the slide or the PowerPoint. Next slide. Now, organizations have relationships with a variety of people for a variety of reasons. You've got employees, you've got vendors, you've got volunteers. Uh, PeopleSoft allows HR to manage the data of all those people. And you can have more than one organizational relationship uh, at any one time, and they can change relationships over time. So here are some of the relationships. An employee, who's a, of course we know what an employee is, a contingent worker, provides services to the organization and does not have a legal employee relationship, and a person of interest. Okay, that is not someone who's been suspected of committing a major crime. <laughs> That is what is used to be known, and I think we, we talk about this a little bit on the next slide. Uh, well, those are contingent workers. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, expand on persons of interest in just a minute. But a contingent worker is not a legal employee, not paid through payroll, not eligible for, for benefits. They might be implementation contractors, building repair crews, and uh, vendors who provide custodial services. And then the person of interest also is not a legal employee, but they, and they may be an ex-employee, but right now we call them MPAs or non-paid affiliates. Uh, they may be paid through payroll for uh, North America. They may be eligible for ben benefits, uh, for example, a surviving spouse um, or COBRA participant. Rehired retirees, board members, COBRA participants, uh, I mentioned surviving spouses and volunteers and interns. So let's, let's see what, what we look at on the system for both the person of interest and the employee and the uh, contingent worker. So we're going to look at the job data. This is Sylvester Stallone. We know he's an employee. I don't know what he's teaching, but acting. He's, he's in our uh, College of Arts. So we've got his work location his position number, his department. Let's look at the next tab. And one of the things I like about this, the job information, for those of you working with ADP, this is, as Joe was saying in the managed self-service and the employee self-service, this is so much cleaner than what we're used to looking at at ADP. We don't have unnecessary tabs and unnecessary locations to put information that doesn't exist. You see he, he is an assistant professor. His job code flew, uh, flowed over from position and I don't remember, it may be on the next slide, we won't move there yet, or not the next slide, the next tab, but uh, override position data is locked. Currently with ADP you can do it, but best practice is not to do it. Right now or not right now. When we move to PeopleSoft, we won't be able to do it. So again, that's a lot cleaner. Now, I want to focus on the job code, just to let you all know, we're, we have a team working on VCATs, so we'll have a more streamlined, a more streamlined process for VCATs. I think Craig said in one of the sessions, I don't remember which one it was, because Craig talked a lot yesterday. <laughs> Does he talk a lot? A lot? <laughs> but in one of the sessions, he described with one USG that we're speaking one language. Well, with job codes and some of the other components of PeopleSoft and one USG, we're, we're speaking one language, but we have different dialects. And that's what the job code will allow. We'll have standard job codes that apply to everybody and some customization because each institution is a little bit different. And we'll talk about that as the project continues. You'll hear more about that. Let's see what's on the job labor panel. Uh, nothing interesting there. Let's see what's on the payroll panel. Okay, so we've got, again, a lot of this information is familiar. You've got the uh, 
effective date, the sequence, whether they're active, uh, the pay group information, employee type, and absence management, which is driven by the pay group, as is the TLM panel. This is really exciting. Yay, let's well, excited. We don't have to go enter, figure out what the TLM status is and enter that. It's all done behind the scenes, it's magic. So yay. And then we've got the salary plan and compensation which is all pretty, pretty standard. And then we've got employment data and you'll notice what's interesting here are the instance records or the, the uh, dates effective dates, you've got seniority date, benefit service date, and pay calc date. I think we've got a, um, a, higher, a, a higher date and a rehire date, but it's all in one place. With ADP, I think there are 100 dates. Here you just have a few. And they're all in one place, so this is really great. And then benefits participation. Benefits program participation. Again, all behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. It's magic. So I think you'll like this. This is really great. And I think this is my cue to turn it over to Travis. So yay, Travis. Yay. 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 And as Travis is coming up, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, the, the um, note cards have been distributed, so please uh, take advantage of submitting those, those cards. And if we have some time at the end of the session, we will try to address some of those questions. Thanks, Barney. Barney. Thanks, Lori. And I'm like, Lori, I like to move. So this is, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling handcuffed up here. So, all right, so I'm just going to follow through with this whole, whole flow. And what we're trying to really show is, again, that all the pieces are flowing together and it's immediate in real time. So you've seen the HR piece. I'm going to go into the benefits piece. And the actions that happen on the HR side, HR side have automatically keyed in onto the benefit side. So uh, we're going to go over, uh, go through these areas, the base benefits, benefits administration, and then the e-benefits where the enrollment actually happens. And I'll be showing you some of those those screenshots and some of the, and we'll actually go through a little bit of self-service. So if we go and go forward, um, again, I just sort of mentioned, you know, it's a broader, seamless application where all of this is talking together. So it's, it's integrated and, um, and the information is being applied immediately, which is great with this system. For those of you, um, you know, I'm not familiar with ADP, but with our system, our legacy system, you know, it may be uh, 24, 48 hours before personnel actually gets through the whole system and helps us to get the benefits going and, and running for that employee. So this is great that this is all real time once it, uh, it's entered in, in the system. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue with Sylvester Stallone. He's actually been pushed through the system already. He already has enrolled in benefits. His payroll has already been run, and he already has a payroll. His payroll deductions have taken place, and you're going to see from the payroll group here shortly the actual pay, paycheck stub. So you'll see that. But what I'm going to do is we'll go through sort of what happened with Sylvester Stallone in terms of how these pieces fell in place. And then I've got a second employee that will go over some self-service that actually is a clone of Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone. Um, so here we're on the, um, basically in the workforce administration with the job data. If we look here, Lori mentioned that you input all the information for this employee. Well, the effective date, if we look here where Stephanie's uh, got a cursor, the September 1, that's the hire date, which also is going to dictate the effective date and the benefits start date. So that's automatically telling um, the Benefits Administration that, that the benefits will be effective on this date. If we go over to the right-hand side, it, it gives the action reason that this is a hire or a new hire. So this is going to generate the actual event. So it now knows the system's going to say, well, this is a new, new employee, new hire, boom, it opens up behind the scenes the ability for this employee to enroll. Um, if we go into job information, so this next piece, if we scroll up just a little bit, Stephanie, if we'll see here, um, screen control scroll a little bit further up, right here in the regular, it shows the type of position the employee's in. So it's a regular full-time position. And you'll see the standard hours right below, the 40 hours, this is going to dictate the benefit platform that this person's going to be able to actually participate in. So it's going to drive 
Again, the 75% and above drives the full benefit eligibility. If this would have shown 20 hours or 25 hours, we would have shown that it only picked up the retirement piece. But again, this is going to be a full, full benefit eligible employee. So it's, again, this has been in there here. And then I guess, let's see, um, why don't we go from here, Stephanie, let's go into the benefit summary, because again, Sylvester is already enrolled. So I'm going to go and show you the benefit summary that's printed out and show what it actually, um, show, it's going to show what he's enrolled in and show that we've actually captured some of the plans for us at UJ a little bit different. We don't have the 403 and 457 inside of enrollment, but it picks up the retirement plans. It's going to pick up the matching. Um, I'm going to pull that up here. While she's bringing that up, I want you also to be aware of as you're, when, when payroll comes up, when you're looking at the paycheck stub, it's going to show the before tax, pre tax. It also on the stub is going to show the actual base rate that, like the life insurance is calculated against. So you'll see the person has a salary of $100,000 and their multiples of salary are based against that, as well as like the long term disability and other benefits are based off the salary. So it has the base compensation on the paycheck stub. All right, so here we can see that on the, on the benefits summary uh, sheet that you're actually going to be able to see the actual health insurance plan. Consumer Choice HSA shows the tiering with the employee plus spouse. Um, you, on the right-hand side, it's got the effective date. You see September 1, like we saw on the, um, on the first job data uh, page. You, if you scroll down a little bit further for me, Stephanie, we've got the 403B, 457 listed here. And you see with the short-term disability, it lists out the 60% of salary, so it gives you that de description as well. And then this person is an ORP. It shows the employee uh, percentage being 6%. And we'll scroll down a little bit more for me, Stephanie. But it includes all the others, flexible spending, tobacco surcharge. Uh, I do believe this one does. Yes, he's a, we do have one tobacco user uh, for Sylvester. So again, this is the benefit summary, shows everything he's enrolled in. And then in payroll, you'll be able to see actually how these are, have been applied with the payroll deductions. And again, it's immediate, real time. This is taking, taking place. It's already set in payroll to go ahead and run. So that's Sylvester, and that's one that's already been through the system. Now what I'm going to do is, or what Steph's going to do is going to pull up um, another employee, Stromboli. And I want to thank David Smith for coming up with these names. I tell you, I mean, we're working with some great names in the system. We've got um, Sylvester Stallone. I think we've got um, Richard Gere, you name it. But um, so Stromboli, we now we're in the actual enrollment here in eBenefit. So this is Stromboli, a clone of Sylvester. And he's actually gone in and made his election. So we're going to go and open up his, his event. And we'll scroll down. And we'll see medical. He's already selected the consumer choice, employee plus spouse. Um, and it gives the before tax out to the right. The edit button would be where that person would go back in and out of the, out of the system to make any changes. This person has a tobacco surcharge, one tobacco surcharge. It has the $75 listed out to the side. Health savings account, because he's in, the, he's chosen the consumer, um, the consumer choice plan, it then opened up for him to have to, to document the tobacco surcharge. So it's picked up that he has medical, and see, he did make an election there. Now I'm going to get Stephanie to open up the health savings account, because we go back into the HR data, this person is over the age of 55, and it's picked up that he has the ability to, to actually contrib contribute more. So you'll see the extra $1,000, that's 7650 So the system's already recognized that based on what was entered from HR. <clears throat> and then again, we can see the other choices that, that uh, he's made, and he's waived a few of the choices. He's not made a couple of choices, too. So he skipped, he skipped dental and su supplemental life. And, but we're going to go ahead and go to the bottom, and I'm going to have Stephanie go ahead and, well, before you do that, Stephanie, it does show the cost summary. It gives, the, it gives a snapshot of what the employees will be expecting on their, um, for their benefits before and after tax. So she's going to go ahead and save and continue, and this will give us the errors. Automatically, it's going to give the employee the errors. Here's what you haven't done, or here's what's, what needs to, some corrections. So it shows us the dental, there was no election made, so, uh, spouse life. Um, and then flexible spending. There was an error there. So we're going to go back into the system. Very easy, very user friendly. So Stephanie's going to dental and she's going to actually enroll him in employee plus spouse and dental coverage. It's very easy. There we go. All right, she's going to click on, on the coverage level. She's attaching the spouse, the dependent. Attaching. That sounded bad, didn't it? Oh. 
Bowling. Nice. Again, I mean, some great names. Then we'll go back into spouse life. She's going to pick $150,000 worth of coverage from spouse life. And this would, would trigger the EOI as well. So, you know, that, that's automatically going to be triggered. And see, it picked up the air that she didn't attach what the spouse life, who the spouse life was attached to. So, and then it's got the note there that expect EOI that you're going to need to substantiate your uh, insurability. And then the last one was the flexible spending. She's going to go in and she's going to do um, $375, I do believe, on flexible spending. And that did say an annual pledge. That's something that will be listed, and it gives the worksheet out to the side. Um, this is picking up. Notice she put 375, and it picked up 125 dollars. It's picking up the last. It's knowing there's only three more pay periods left for the rest of the year. So it's all, it's smart enough to pick that up as well. And then we'll update. Same too. All right. So again, there, it's seamless. Again, it is coming straight from HR, um, and payroll is picking it up at the same time. So that's one thing that we're really excited about. That it's real time, and the data is being moved. From from those those modules uh, immediately. So again, oh, we got an error. You're uh, it's just oh, it's just on the, insur the insurability. So give us the, the note for the insurability. All right, and that's that's where we are with benefits. I won't take up too much of Jennifer's time here, but I wanted to point out. One thing as we transition into time and labor, before we get into payroll, this will be our last segment before we break. We're introducing a new term here. We, you know, when we, we move into a new system, there's generally, you know, there's new terminology that we use. Absence management is going to be something that we're going to refer to in a number of different modules. You've seen it in our, our, our flows, and, and you're clearly seeing it here in this, this new slide. Uh, absence management is a new area within PeopleSoft, and it's something that we're going to use you know, heavily with the benefit eligible employees. Time and labor and absence uh, will now affect every single employee in, the, uh, in our institutions. 100% of employees will somehow be working through this. From the user's experience, it'll all be one seamless system. It's gonna, it's gonna look like one time card for them, whether it's on Fluid or through the employee self-service that we'll show you here. Uh, but from from the you know, practitioner side, it's it's important to understand that these are two clearly different areas because absence is the area of record for hours or time that's not worked, and time and labor is the area of record for time worked. Um, once we get that synced in, uh, it's it's really quite simple and it's a uh, it's a seamless process. The important thing to note on this slide, you know, a lot of arrows going back and forth, but employee schedules really act as the foundation for all of this to work together seamlessly. So employee schedules are very important for benefit eligible employees, and they'll all be in the system. It's a fair, it's it's fairly flexible, uh, but I just want to make sure that we understand that those will be in the system. All right, now what you all came for, a little time and labor and absence management. <laughs> so the first thing I'm going to talk about are the different time reporting methods for PeopleSoft. And now if I read a little bit, please bear with me. I want to make sure I get all my points across that I needed to say. Uh, there are three different time reporting methods for PeopleSoft. The online time card, of course, which we're going to show you today in the system. The web clock, which we can compare that to our timestamp function today in ADP as well as a time clock once those go live at the institutions that use time clocks. I know there was some discussion on time clocks yesterday, so those will be up and running for the institutions that need to use those. So I just want to make another note and say it one more time that this system is real time. Once you click the save button on the employee's information, the employee will be almost immediately enrolled into time and labor at least 80% of the time. There'll be no more waiting overnight as we've become accustomed to so that the employee can enter time. <laughs> so now you know you're going to have fallout and it's not going to work every single time. If there is an instance where it does not work, there are two other alternatives. The first one would be to create time reporter data for an employee that's never worked here before. The second one would be to uh, maintain time reporter data. This would be for a transfer or for someone that's left and come back you know, somebody that has data already in the system. So Dan's going to show us that page. So 
So, and you go in and this kind of um, just details the employee's information that's needed for time and labor, whether they're an elapsed time reporter or a punch time reporter. Um, it shows what punch template they use, as well as what work group they're in. Um, the work group can now kind of be compared to our pay groups that we use now. Um, so Dan's going to actually go to the work group so we can show you the detail behind it. The work group details an employee's rule program as well as their TRC program. The TRC program, you can say salary benefited, hourly benefited, or non-benefited, whichever applies to the employee. Um, the work group also stipulates whether an employee is an exception time reporter or a positive time reporter, an elapsed time or punch time reporter. So this is pretty important data because it gives the employee the ability to do what they need to do. Uh, the rounding rules are also stored here, and if you um, haven't been made aware, the decision has been made to go to a six-minute rounding rule. Uh, that'll be a lot different from our 15-minute rounding rule that we use now, so that'll take a little bit of getting used to. Um, so now we're actually going to log in as Sylvester Stallone and show you the time card. Now, Dr. Stallone is a 10-month faculty member, and we're going to show you... <laughs> If you don't laugh. <laughs> so we're going to show you how he's going to put time off on his time card. Come on, that always brings a laugh. No? Okay. So we're going to pull that up, and um, Dan's right now toggling between the different views that you can view by, whether it's calendar period, day, or week. You can kind of change your date to fit what you need for that time. Um, Okay, so there it goes. He's got it pulled up, and now we're actually going to add an absence event for Dr. Stallone. There is no more, or there will be no more, just putting time on your time card, even if you were gone unexpectedly, and now we just go and put the time on our time card. In this case, in PeopleSoft, you will still come through and submit an absence request. There's no, because there's no backwards feed from time and labor to absence management, the time has to be requested through an absence event. So, um, I believe that Dan wants to play golf on October 5th, so he is going to request off sick time using a headache as his excuse, <laughs> well, well in advance. So, and this is another good time to mention, <laughs> he can't stand me. <laughs> this is a good time to mention how important schedules are to both time and labor and absence management. Dan said that, and I'm going to reiterate it by saying the system now, or the system we're moving forward to, is so much smarter than the system we have now. Um, there will be no more having to request time off separately for time that falls over a weekend or time that falls over a holiday, because you'll have a schedule input. The system will not let you take time off on a day you're scheduled to work. So there'll be no more correcting that, which will be a big win. So uh, Dan is showing, I mean, this is just your standard time off request. It's a lot like what we're used to. Of course, the start date, the end date, um, the absence name, and the reason. Um, Dan, would you show the reasons? I mean, these are just kind of generic, and we're just kind of going with these. There's always the other for things that, you know, people don't want to say is wrong with them or things like that. I think that'll probably be the most commonly used. Besides the stomach ache, I feel like that would be used a lot. So the system... The toothache, we might should add that one on. Um, I guess, well, since you're on the absence reason code, I guess the HIPAA thing is just getting in the code. Yeah. And then the absence reason code is just getting in the code. So I guess that would be the other thing. Because if you're not necessarily saying I have a headache, it could be child illness or that type of stuff or FMLA or what other than I have a headache. Right. You would use the other and perhaps enter a comment for those if your child was sick or if it was some other reason that you felt necessary to share. The FMLA time will be discussed in just a moment on the extended leave request. Okay. So. so, and the system also can calculate the duration that you need to be off based on your schedule and whether you chose a full day or a partial day because you actually have the availability to select a partial day. So it will calculate that based off of your schedule. So we viewed the short-term leave options, and so now you, um, it's been submitted. I'm sorry, he submitted it. I missed that part. So it's there. That'll go to your supervisor for approval. And that'll be approved and be placed on your time card, kind of a lot like what we do now. Um, now let's view the extended leave request. This will go to the FMLA that was just asked about. 
Yes, sir. Okay, in that case, you're talking about for time that's already been signed off and paid. Uh, the manager will have access to one pay period back to enter those for employees. No, I mean, like, it's Wednesday and you were out sick Monday. You can still submit that. You still request that and submit that. Yeah. Currently, the ADP won't, it doesn't like going back. Right, you can't, right. So now you will be able to going forward. You'll just come in and request it just like any other day. And you have to. There's no other way for it to get on your time card. Yep. Um, so now we're going to view the extended absence request and the leave options that we have available for that. Currently in our system for the ADP institutions, we only have access to FMLA, medical, military, and miscellaneous. If you notice, we grew the list just a bit and added some more options for everyone. Um, we added educational professional development leave, medical non-FMLA, personal, and workman's comp. So those options are available for an employee to go out and choose from when they request extended leave. This is different, you know, it's like now, you have one module for selecting short-term leave requests, whether it's just your sick or vacation, and another module for requesting long-term leave. The, and this system will be a little bit easier because although you still go here to request the long-term leave, to get it approved and to get it in progress and to get everybody aware of the situation, you will still do short-term leave requests for the days you need to be off if you're off on intermittent FMLA. So that way everybody's kind of aware because currently the manager may not be in the loop as much of when an employee is going to be off, but now the manager will actually approve those requests and they'll go to the leave admin as well. So I think that's it about extended leave requests. And so now Dan is going to log in as Cuba Gooding, who is our multiple job employee. And I don't think we have a picture, so I'm sorry about that. If I'd have known about the pictures, we'd have uploaded some. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's our multiple job employee. You saw him in the last session. He is a police officer and a part-time coach. That's just the way it works. So, we're going to, if you notice here, both of his jobs pull up. So, there's no more going in and guessing what job you're transferring your time to, what job you're working at that time. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> So you can pick, and it's based off of wording. That's very simple. Are you coaching right now, or are you being a police officer right now? It'll make it a lot easier for the employees. So Dan is going to access the time card, and we're just going to show a few features of that, how you can toggle between the jobs. He's going to change the date first. And I should say as a note that when the system is live, there won't be all this date changing. It will you know, default to the date you're in. So we're having to change a lot of dates because of the system we have set up right now, but the dates will default later. So um, a few um, good things. You can toggle back and forth between the jobs for an employee. Um, that takes you to the different jobs, whether it's the coach or the police officer, you can just move back and forth. Um, you'll also notice that it says reported hours. Now, and I want to point out right now that he has 12 hours for his police officer job listed right now. So the system is telling you that he has 12 reported hours. Right now, the system is not configured to add the cumulative total for both jobs, but there is a customization in progress that will show this as a cumulative total of hours between both jobs. So that'll be helpful once that's done. So now Dan is actually going to enter time. And if you'll notice, he's going to do it, for those of you that can see well, he's going to enter it in a number of different ways. 0800, 12P, 1 o'clock, military time, any format is acceptable. And once you save the time, it kind of all populates the way you saw it when we first entered. It takes all the time and converts it to 8 a.m. or whatever it is for that time. So he's entered time for two additional days, and now once the time is ready, the employee has to submit it for approval. The employee submits the time, and it goes to the manager for approval so that it can be forwarded into the payroll process. So I think it's a little intuitive. I think it'll be nice. Uh, the next thing we're going to show you is the calendar, and we've, we think that the calendar tool will be very helpful for managers. Um, the calendar tool actually list out different TRCs and schedules by colors. So the employee schedule is listed in gray. And let me stop here and say, Dan's gonna pull up 
the time reporter group that we created for Georgia Summit, which is going to pull up both of our employees. The time reporter group can kind of be uh, related to a hyperphone <coughs> query that we use now. It's just build, pulling back people that you need to view. So if you'll see, ours pulled up the two people we've been working with, and it pulled up both of Cuba's jobs. So you'll see the gray boxes over to the right and the legend at the bottom. The gray boxes are the employee's schedule. That's when the employee is scheduled to work. You'll see different TRC codes listed in different colors. And the legend will be at the bottom to tell you what color is what. But there is also a description. We all know what RPT is. So you'll learn those if there are different ones that you don't know off the top of your head, but you'll know those before long. So this is a very helpful tool for managers because at a, a quick glance you can see, well, who's supposed to work and who's off today? You know, just try to keep up with your employees. There are also different views for the calendar. You can view it daily, weekly, or monthly. So whatever information you need, you can just pull that. All right, so I think next we're going to approve payable time. And this is actually done as the manager, that the manager would approve the time for the employee. And so again, remember you won't have to change these dates in the future. And so once it refreshes, you're going to see the time for your employees that needs to be approved. And my biggest note here is that you cannot select these employees from the summary view. The manager has to go into the detail of the uh, transaction to approve it. So there'll be no more blanket approvals. Okay, so we're through a little early, which is surprising. Um, that's all we had planned to show. I do have one more comment to make, and then we might open it up for some questions if they're quick. Um, the, uh, the comment that I wanted to speak about, which I speak about, I think, at every meeting we have about 1USG, is time card approval. And we've been working on this since the beginning of 1USG, trying to make time card approval mandatory for all employees and managers, making sure that it's legitimate time work and that it's being approved and it's real. Um, so it has been approved that we can add the T to the policy that says if you do not approve your time card or if you do not approve your employees time cards, uh, the institution has the uh, option to follow their progressive discipline policy that they have in place at the institution to hold, to hold the managers and the employees accountable, to add the teeth really. So that is um, our latest decision from time and labor. <laughs> Not saying hold pay, but do the progressive discipline in order to make them do it the next time. You know, I mean, of course, we can't legally withhold pay, but as much as you might like to sometimes. <laughs> Faculty, everybody, this is mandatory. All right, I guess I'll open it up for some questions if anybody has some. Cece? All right, Sissy asked if once the time has been submitted by the employee, does the manager get a notification saying, hey, you have this time out here that needs to be improved for your employee? Um, the answer to that is no. Right now, we have all notifications turned off um, because that's just so many notifications that they would get for that because the employee can actually submit time multiple times during the pay period. We've actually, if you noticed on the page besides submit, there was a save for later. We've actually discussed taking away that save for later because it's going, to, an employee has to submit the time. If it's not submitted, it's not picked up. So if an employee just saves it, which you're used to doing because you're used to saving your time, that could cause some delays in payment and some people not being paid. So we've discussed removing that option, but once it's submitted, no, no notification is generated. Who else? And we'll take questions for other areas too, but go ahead. A lot of the times a manager will just go in and, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question if y'all didn't hear it. He wanted me to expand on blanket approvals when I said no more blanket approvals. A lot of the times a manager will just go in, select all, and click approve, never having viewed the time card or the time worked. So this actually forces them to go in and see the detail of the employee. Our current system, I know you're not on ADP, but our current system 
if you just pull up your employees, you can approve them when you don't see anything about their time. You just see their name and click approve, and that's what a lot of people do. So we're trying to force people to go in and actually view the time and verify it. No, Dan, can you go back there quickly? It lists it out on the approval page on once you click on, yeah. Once you click on the employee, it lists it out by type and hour associated with that type. Dan can pull that up real quick. Maybe. We weren't prepared for that. Off script. That was real good on script. <laughs> yes, he did very good on script, but when you get land blasted, it's harder. I'm glad y'all find me so amusing because I'll just tell you the truth. I was a little nervous this morning. <laughs> but I'm good now. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> no, don't ask any questions. Don't ask any questions. So once she went into the employee, it lists the time with the date and the hours associated with that time. If there were more employees, there'd be a next. And if you have more employees, there is a next. You can toggle between the employees. And this, did you get, Dan, Barney said you about the summary page, are you there? There's only one listed here, but you see it lists the hours, but that's a cumulative hour across the jobs, or will be a cumulative hour across the jobs. So it's just saying, the employee could say, hey, I work 90 hours, and the manager could approve it. So we're just trying to stop that. All right, yes, ma'am. On the accruals, if they don't approve, excuse me, if they don't approve their time, then they will have to pay them Right. What do you? It's a separate system. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Allison. Oh, five minutes. I'm sorry. We have five minutes. Any more questions? We'll take questions from other areas. We might not be able to answer them, but somebody may can in here. Okay, all right, that's a valid point. Sandy wanted me to expand a little bit on the transfer. You know, currently with the ADP systems, you go in and it's a very manual process to transfer your hours. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The secondary manager can't see the employee unless the employee transfers time and transfers time correctly. That would be the key word because a lot of time it's done incorrectly. In PeopleSoft, when we get there, the manager will be able to see the employee regardless if the employee has transferred time or put time on that record, the manager will still be able to pull the employee up. Yes, ma'am. That would be just, let me, let me repeat the question, I'm sorry. When we go in and select sick, for a reason being off with the headache being the reason, um, that data would be stored in absence management, correct? I mean, it's just there for documentation. that you, The manager sees it in the request, and it's stored in the system on the absence management side. We're going to have to get used to it being kind of two separate places for further, you know, for use later if you need to pull that documentation later. And I should also say, when we pulled up Dr. Salone and selected reasons, you'll notice you didn't see vacation because he's a 10-month faculty member. The reasons will be limited based on what the employee actually accrues. So there'll be no more sick pay for sick, C pay for sick, I'm sorry. They'll only, the employee only has access to what the employee deserves or what they're owed. Amy? I know that Right. Um, has there been any discussions about what the vendor fees from the benefits and the timing of that as far as we put them in the system to cut down on some of the haste enrollments that we're having to have? I'm hoping Travis might can help with that question. All right, I believe we're approaching the end. Any more quick? 
please write those down? If you have any, please write them down and please try to go in and do the survey for this class and thank you for attending.